Well, good morning, Walden Church. We are in our second week of a series entitled Called to be Saints. Romans 1, Paul addressing the Romans, and in his letter he says, to all who are in Rome, beloved of God, called to be saints. And I believe what we've been studying lately leads us to believe that God wants us to be whole people, complete people, certainly not perfect people, right? But people who reflect God's heart, people who are becoming more and more like his son. Because none of us have made it, right? We're all students. We've all got more to learn. It's back to school season right now. And so we adopt new qualities of what growth looks like, what maturity looks like. Last week, we looked at uh, integrity. We looked at being honest people because we said those are qualities of being a follower of Jesus. Those are qualities of being a saint. Corinthians 1, Paul addresses the church and he says to the church of God that is in Corinth, to those sanctified in Christ Jesus, called to be saints. The saint word, that title, was, was Paul's favorite word for describing Christians. But we don't think of ourselves as being a saint, do we? Instead, we think about saints as uh, being people that we wear around our necks uh, on little pendants or people who are in stained glass windows like St. Peter or St. Augustine or St. Patrick. But according to the Bible, we are all saints. It, it comes from the word holy, which means set apart. We are, we are people who are set apart for a special purpose. Paul is profoundly concerned with holiness. He has a burning passion that disciples of Christ are holy people. So if you're a Christian and you're watching this morning, you've been called to be a saint. And over the next couple of weeks, I just want to examine what that means, what it means to be a Christian, a disciple, and then what those actions look like. Because we've had plenty of sermons about what Christians believe, right? But what about what we do, how we act? And I think we can take a look at the early church and we can see what they did. And I think we can start to begin to put together uh, a list of qualities that we can adopt. We talked about integrity. We talked about honesty. This week, I want to talk about generosity. A very popular passage about the early church is found in Acts 2.42. It says, Now the full number of those who believed were of one heart and soul, and no one said that any of the things that belonged to him was his own, but they had everything in common. Now, what does this mean? Does it mean that the early church believed in communism or socialism? No, it means, it means the people liked each other, right? So they shared with each other. They helped each other. They lived together. So they knew one another. They knew what needs each other had. That means you loan your neighbor your truck when he needs it. That means you told the neighbor kids, hey, you can come over and use our pool anytime you want. It means you know your neighbors well enough that you can walk next door and you can ask for a cup of flour. It means when you find out that the mother next door to you had a miscarriage this week, that you bring her meals a few nights. That means when you find out that someone in your church community has died, you send them a card, even if you don't know them. You use your time. You're generous with your wealth. You're generous with your possessions. And you're generous with your talent. Why? To show love. To show love to someone else. Everyone, this church, brings what they have and they share. James 1.17 says, Every good gift and every perfect gift is from above, coming down from the Father. And I think the early church recognized this, that, that everything they had was a gift from God. And so if you can help someone, then you did. If you can help someone, then you do help someone. Last week, we read Acts chapter 4. It says, With great power the apostles were giving their testimony to the resurrection of the Lord Jesus, and great grace was upon them all. There was not a needy person among them. 
For as many as were owners of lands or houses sold them and brought the proceeds of what they sold and laid it at the apostles' feet, and it was distributed to each as any had need. The church lived in a culture of generosity. Do we? What do you think? Is that how you would describe the culture that we live in now? Are we generous? Do the Black Friday lines outside the stores in the early morning, do those look like lines of generosity? (laughs) Probably not today, right? Society creates more a culture of scarcity. Don't believe me? Okay. How much toilet paper do you have? (laughs) How many commercials that you watch end with, you better hurry, you better run on down, things... They are flying off the shelf, right? It's it's going fast. Don't be left out. Don't be left behind. You don't want to be the last one. We have a culture of scarcity. We live in a culture also of entitlement. We see a commercial for a new truck, and it says, you deserve a new car. We see commercials for new living room furniture, and it says, you deserve better. Can you afford new? Can you afford better? Doesn't matter. I deserve it. And problem is, we hear it so much that we believe it. And we repeat it to ourselves when we take it off the rack and when we try it on. I deserve better. I deserve more. And it may not be the TV that you can afford, but it's the TV that you deserve. It may not be the truck you can afford, but it's the truck you deserve. And then once it is yours, guard it, protect it. Why? Because the world outside wants to take it from you. Lock your doors, buy an alarm. You need to look out for you and yours. There's not enough out there. Protect what you have, protect your own. But guess what? When you die, all of your possessions are going to the goodwill. They're going out to the curb. They're going out to garage sales. Your nice truck, and your kid's going to sell it, or he's going to drive it into the ground. He's going to forget to put oil in it. Your big TV, garage sale. So the early church, a long time ago, they realized you can't take it with you. And people are more important than things. So they decided, you know, if I can help someone, I'm going to. And we might think, well, that's great. You know, that's great for the people that can afford it. And and don't get me wrong, I'd love to be one of those people, but I'm just a college student. Or, you know, I just work retail. I just work at Starbucks. All right, let's say you work at Starbucks, okay? We'll just throw that out as an example. You work at Starbucks. Maybe you bring home, what, $200 a week? 200 bucks a week, let's say. So $200 a week, that's $12,000 a year. You make $12,000 a year. And that's without any other money coming in, right? Grandma and grandpa aren't sending you money for your birthday. You didn't find 20 bucks in the road. There's no tips in that, right? You're just a poor college student and you make $12,000 a year. Did you know that that puts you in the top 87% of the wealthiest people in the world? It's true. In fact, the average salary in the United States is $37,000. That's the average salary, $37,000. Now, we might say, that's not a lot of money. That's not a lot of money. Maybe not. But that $37,000 puts you in the top 96th percentile of the wealthiest people in the world. And let's say you made $60,000. It's a little better, right? Make $60,000. That puts you in the 99 percentile. That means everybody who makes 60K or over is in the top 99 percentile of the world. And you know, those 60Kers, right? Those 60Kers, they dream about being wealthy. They dream about being millionaires. You wanna hear something crazy? To move from a $60,000 a year To a million, it only bumps you up half a percent. 
Here in the USA, we live in a culture of abundance. We live in opulence. We live in luxury. We live in wealth. If you don't believe me, we spent $34 billion last year on pets. Yeah, on our pets. Dressing our pets, buying uh, little pet houses, pet food, right? $34 billion. Last year, we spent $38 billion on magazine subscriptions and newspapers. That means when you're at the checkout line and you see all those magazines and you're riffling through them or maybe you pick one or two up, we spent $35.8 billion on magazines last year. $59.7 billion on toys and sports. And flowers? <laughs> flowers. We spent $18.2 billion on flowers. We live in a culture of abundance. Why? God, <laughs> totally God, because of God's grace. You live here in the USA because of God's grace. None of us had anything to do with who we'd be born to or where. So the fact that you were born to those parents and you had all those opportunities, that you had those giftings, those abilities to generate the money that you do, it's all one big, beautiful gift from God. So when the Bible says about the early church, there was not a needy person among them, we understand that first church was generous. They figured we follow Jesus and Jesus cared about people, so the church should also care about people. The church took care of widows and orphans. Like we saw last week, people who had land, people who had property, they sold it, they sold their birthright, their inheritance, and they used that money to help other members of the church. Why did they do that? What was their motivation? Verse 33 says, And with great power the apostles were giving their testimony to the resurrection of the Lord Jesus, and great grace was upon them all. What does that mean? It means they believed in the resurrection. They literally believed that Jesus rose from the dead. And that means that Jesus was alive, right? Jesus is alive and he lives among them. Jesus is not the dead figurehead of your company. He's not some dead CEO that started this company a long time ago. He is a living, breathing, powerful, generous CEO of this company and he's up there in his office right now. And sometimes he comes out of his office and he walks among our cubicles and he's looking down. And then when he's looking in my cubicle, what does he see me doing? Am I making phone calls? Am I promoting the kingdom? Am I giving out loans and aid and supporting our customer base? Or do I have my feet up and am I just playing solitaire on the computer? The early church said, this is what we were told to do, so we're going to do it. They didn't think, you know... I'd like to, but I don't know, maybe when I'm better off. Maybe when I'm better off, then I'll give. You know, when I win the lottery, <laughs> when I win the lottery, man, I am really going to do some good in this world. Or, you know, when my kids are out of college. Oh, man, have you seen college bills? When my, when my kids are out of college, then I'll give. We're always generous when we win the lottery, right? In other words, our philosophy is, hey, when I get some more, then I'll give. But you're already in the top percent of the wealthiest people in the world. How much more do you need to get before you'll give? The early church believed they already had everything, so they gave. And as a result, they got even more. God gave them more so that they could give more. Listen to Jesus in his Sermon on the Mount in Luke 6. Jesus says, Judge not, and you will not be judged. Condemn not, and you will not be condemned. Forgive, and you will be forgiven. Give, and it will be given to you. Good measure, pressed down, shaken together, running over will be put into your lap. For with the measure you use, 
it'll be measured back to you. Jesus says, okay, here's how it works, okay? You, you love first. You love first. You forgive first. You give first. And then after that, I will bless you. Because you can't outgive God. In fact, God says he's going to give you so much that what? He says, I'm going to have to jump into the can and smash it all down so that I can put more in there. And then he says, that I'm going to dump it all into your lap. That's what it says. And he says, with the same measure, with the same measure that you use, that's how God will bless you. Now, notice that Jesus says here that when we give, we don't simply get back what we give, but we actually get more back than what we give. This is the principle of multiplication. It's one of the truths of planting and harvesting is that whatever you plant or harvest, you always get back more than what you sow. In fact, if farmers uh, just got back what they put out, they couldn't make a living. You can't make a living as a farmer if you are constantly breaking even. I mean, think of it like, like popcorn. Like popcorn is my favorite example because my boys, my boys love popcorn. You know, they'll, my boys say, I'm hungry, and they ask me for a snack. I'm like a hero. I just throw in this tiny flat bag of popcorn into the microwave. I hit the buttons, right? And three minutes later, huge, fluffy bag filled with delicious popcorn. A little bag of flat kernels makes a huge bag of popcorn. Just like when we give, God takes what we have given and then he multiplies it. You know, a very familiar passage about giving is found in Malachi chapter three. Bring the full tithe into the storehouse that there may be food in my house and thereby put me to the test, says the Lord of hosts, if I will not open the windows of heaven for you and pour down for you a blessing until there is no more need. God says, test me in this. If you don't believe me, test me, and you just see if the blessing doesn't just spill out all over the place. You know, there's so much of it, you'll get so much of it that you won't even know what to do with it all. That's what happens when we give. God multiplies it. Multiplies it so much that we won't even have room for the increase. So what does it take to get there? How do we get this blessing? How do we get this increase? One word, obedience. Deuteronomy 28 is called the blessing of obedience. Check this out. Deuteronomy 28 says, if you faithfully obey the voice of the Lord your God, being careful to do all his commandments that I command you today, the Lord your God will set you high above all the nations of the earth and all the blessings shall come upon you and overtake you if you obey the voice of the Lord your God. Blessed shall you be in the city and blessed shall you be in the field. Blessed shall be the fruit of your womb and the fruit of your ground and the fruit of your cattle, the increase of your herds and the young of your flock. Blessed shall be your basket and your kneading bowl. Blessed shall be you when you come in and blessing when you go out. The Lord will cause your enemies to rise against you and to defeat before you. They shall come out against you one way and flee before you seven ways. The Lord will command the blessing on you in your barns and in all you undertake, and he will bless you in the land that the Lord your God is giving you. Why? Why be obedient? Why be obedient? Why obey God? Why do what God asks? What is in it for me? Blessing. Obedience to the Lord brings blessing. We receive an abundance. We receive more than we expect. God says, you obey me, okay? You obey me and all these blessings shall come upon you and overtake you. Read this chapter if you ever need that motivation to obey. Say, why, why should I obey? Read this chapter and look at all those blessings. But before we get too excited, 
Let's go back and remember something that we read in Luke chapter 6 one more time, okay? And, and just see how that verse ends, because it says, for with the measure you use, it'll be measured to you. So what does that mean? It means we get to decide the blessing, right? We do. And one of my favorite stories is in the Bible, uh, in the book of Kings. I, I love the stories about Elijah and Elisha the prophet. And there's a story in 2 Kings 4 where Elisha is staying with a poor widow and he wants to pay her back for her kindness. And she doesn't have a lot. So he tells her to collect as many empty jars and vessels as she can find in her house. And he tells her to pour the last remaining drops of oil that she has into one of the jars. And as she starts pouring out the oil, it just keeps flowing. It keeps flowing and it never stops and it fills every single jar that she brought. God filled her jars according to her faith. She brought five jars, then she had five jars of oil. If she had brought 5,000 jars, she would have had 5,000 jars of oil. The blessing was tied to the faith of the one who was being blessed. And that's another basic truth about sowing and reaping. It's another truth about harvesting. The more you plant, the more you harvest, right? It's popcorn faith. You get out so much more than you get in. 2 Corinthians 9 says, the point is this, whoever sows sparingly will also reap sparingly, and whoever sows bountifully will also reap bountifully. I'm not telling you anything that you don't already know, right? If you plant two fields of corn, <laughs> you're going to get more corn than if you just plant one, right? This is common sense. Same with giving. The more you give, the more you get. Now, Am I saying that if you start tithing and giving to the kingdom right now, that you're going to instantly become rich and you'll never have another problem in your life? No, I am not saying that. Far from it. Run away from anyone who preaches that message. What I'm saying is you can't outgive God. If you provide him with the seed, he can bring the harvest. He will bring the harvest in your life. He will bring the harvest in the church. Pastor Robert Schuller said, any fool knows how many seeds are in an apple, but only God knows how many apples are in a seed. It's one thing to read and study and hear a passage and know that God expects me to give, but it's another thing to know that God has promised that if I give, that he said that he would bless me as well. And let's not always assume that when we talk about giving, that just means money, right? I know that's what we're conditioned to think, but talent and time are just as equally important. Talent and time are just as equally valuable to the kingdom. God's kingdom needs all of these things to grow. So in the Sermon on the Mount, in Matthew 6, when Jesus says, do not lay up yourselves treasures on earth, why not? Well, you can't take it with you, right? We can't take it with us, and we don't live in a society of scarcity. He says, where moth and rust destroy and where thieves break in and steal, but lay up for yourselves treasures in heaven, where neither moth nor rust destroys and where thieves do not break in and steal. For where your treasure is, there your heart will be also. Where is your treasure? What is your treasure? What is the treasure in your life? Is it your time? Is it your energy? Is it your talent, your skills, your family, your job, your money? What do you have of value that you can offer the kingdom? Now, why am I saying all of this? Why, am I, why is this the sermon today? Why are we here? Why are we talking about this? Oh, I know. I, ah, ha, ha, ha. I know. It's been COVID these last couple months, and I bet the church is hurting. I bet we're low on funds. You know, and the preacher is busting out his old annual, we need money speech. Nope. It's not true. As of this month, 
you have given $259,000. 259. And last year, at this same time, you had given 245,000. So that means we have more money in the bank today than we did at the same time last year. That's awesome, right? I am so grateful that these last few months, God's people have continued to give. Some of you have even learned to give electronically. Others of you drove here or you rode your bike here even when the sanctuary was closed. In fact, I felt so blessed and so proud to see people driving into the parking lot to drop off their envelopes through the Family Life Center doors, even though we weren't even having church. <laughs> you guys are amazing. And I was never worried through the entire pandemic it, that we would pay our bills, that we would pay our staff, that we would keep our lights on. I knew we would never have to worry. Not with you here. I know you. I know the people in this community. I know their willingness to give and their generosity. Budget-wise, if you were to look at the budget, we're about 14,000 under budget. That's it. We're 14,000 under budget right now, but that's okay. We're not spending as much as we used to. How are we on the building fund and all of the changes we made around here? We have about $9,000 more to go. $9,000 more, and we'll have paid off all of our remodel. Now, that's good news, but we're taking on another project. <laughs> we are. We're taking on a new project right now to replace four doors in our church. Yeah, four doors. Four doors is going to cost us $6,000. <laughs> it's true, because they're exit doors. They're emergency doors. They're fire doors. And so... Uh, we have a door over here on my left for the choir room. We have a door over here on my right for uh, Mike's office. Um, both of those right now lock with a deadbolt. And those are our emergency exits in case of emergency. And so by law, they really should be crash bars so that you can get out. And we also have two more doors over in the Family Life Center that belong to the nursery and the preschool room. Both of those also lock with a deadbolt. And that's just not safe. Uh, the classroom doors should also be crash handle doors so that people can get out in case of fire or emergency. And so to replace those four doors and to bring them up to code is gonna cost another $6,000. But we know that we can do it. We know that it's what we're supposed to do. We're gonna you know, obey the law, of course, and replace our doors, but we also know that the people in our church are generous and we're not worried. Proverbs 3 says, Honor the Lord with your wealth and with the first fruits of all you produce. Then your barns will be filled with plenty and your vats will be bursting with wine. Again, the idea is you give first. You give first and then you get and you can't outgive God. He is a generous God. All the wealth of the universe is his. So these people in the early church, they gave first. They gave first and they looked out for one another. Not because they were trying to level the field. Not because they were socialists. But because they loved each other. John 13 says, a new commandment I give to you that you love one another just as I have loved you, you are also to love one another. And then it's by this that all people will know that you are my disciples if you have love for one another. Jesus says, the world will know that you're mine, that you belong to me, that you're a Christian if you love we're called to be lovers. It doesn't matter what Bible translation you have in your hand. It doesn't matter how you dress. It doesn't matter what church you go to, what denomination you belong to. Being a Christian is defined by love. God expects us to be honest and generous and loving. Yeah, but shouldn't I wait to give? I mean, I got a lot of debt. When I get out from underneath all this debt, then I'll give. No. The order is 
God first. The order is always God first in everything, right? I give my entire life to him, God first. Listen, last week we read the story of Ananias and Sapphira, right? Remember, they wanted to look generous. They wanted to look generous. They wanted to look loving. So they gave. They gave to the church. They sold property. They gave it to the church. But rather than giving to God first, they chose to hold back part of the proceeds to keep some of that money for themselves. And last week we saw that Pastor Peter got mad at them. He rebuked their gift, and he told Ananias that Satan had filled his heart. But we didn't finish the story. Do you know what happened? Basically, Ananias and Sapphira came into an inheritance, and they decided to give money to the church, right? They won the lottery, and they said, we're going to give some money to the church. But first, they gave to themselves. First, they took some off the top. And then they gave to God. And we could say, what's wrong with that? Right? I mean, it's their money. It was their inheritance. Acts 5, Peter says, Ananias, why has Satan filled your heart to lie to the Holy Spirit and to keep back for yourself part of the proceeds of the land? While it remained unsold, did it not remain your own? And after it was sold, was it not at your disposal? Why is it that you have contrived this deed in your heart? You have not lied to man, but to God. When Ananias heard these words, he fell down and breathed his last. And great fear came upon all who heard of it. The young men rose and wrapped up and carried him out and buried him. After an interval of about three hours, his wife came in, not knowing what had happened. And Peter said to her, tell me whether you sold the land for so much. And she said, yes, for so much. But Peter said to her, how is it that you have agreed together to test the spirit of the Lord. Behold, the feet of those who have buried your husband are at the door, and they will carry you out. And immediately she fell down at his feet and breathed her last. When the young men came in and found her dead, they carried her out and buried her beside her husband. And great fear came upon the whole church and upon all who heard of these things. What happened? <laughs> they both died. Wow, this is the harshest lesson of you can't take it with you that you will ever read, right? They stole from God and God struck them dead. Why? Why was God so harsh with them? Verse 11, that's why. Great fear upon the whole church and upon all who heard of these things. They were made an example of. Remember, this is the early church. It's in its baby stages. It has to continue to grow. It has to continue to be everything that they are supposed to be. They have to be on track, doing what Jesus said. So we can't start off. We can't all start off collectively as a people if there are some of us who are selfish and who are putting themselves first. It's not going to work. This whole doing life together Right? This whole communal living, loving our brother as ourself, loving our neighbor as ourself, loving our enemy as ourself, it's not going to work if some of us are selfish and we put ourselves first. We can't have the wrong people. We can't have the wrong example out there leading the way. We need people who are loving. We need people who have a passion for holiness. We need saints. We need people who are generous. And this isn't going to work with a church of people who are thinking to themselves, I deserve better than this. I deserve more than this. My family deserves better than this. When Jesus teaches the story of the Good Samaritan, the man who helps takes the wounded man, right? He takes the wounded man to the inn and he, and he pays the beaten man's medical bills and he says to the innkeeper, Take care of him and put everything on my tab. And Jesus tells this story as an example of love. The first two pastors by were people who worked for the temple. They were religious. 
They were religious on the outside. And Jesus' point was, they were fake on the inside. They were hypocrites. They saw the wounded man on the side of the road, and they said to themselves, the money in my pocket belongs to me. I deserve it. And I don't want to get involved. But an enemy of that man lying in the ditch, he stops. Now, was the Good Samaritan rich? Probably not. Was anyone watching him? Probably not. But the Good Samaritan doesn't act out of a desire to look good. He doesn't act to receive praise, and he probably can't afford it. We have no idea what his wife said when he got home. You did what? You paid whose medical bills? Why did you do this? But being loving and being generous, if it's a true thing in your heart, if it's really who you are authentically, then you're the kind of person who does these things even when you could really use the money also. You give even if you haven't won the lottery, even with a kid in college, even with two car payments and a mortgage. In Luke 21, the Bible says Jesus looked up and saw the rich putting their gifts into the offering box, and he saw a poor widow put in two small copper coins, and he said, truly I tell you, this poor widow has put in more than all of them, for they all contributed out of their abundance but she, out of her poverty, put in all she had to live on. You see, it's not about how much we give. It's simply about how we give. When you're generous, when you're loving, you just give. And it's hard. I, I know it is. I know it is. My first impulse right? My first impulse is to grab all the paper towels for myself. <laughs> grab all the toilet paper for myself, right? My first impulse is to run ahead of the guy next to me. My first impulse is to cut in line. My first impulse is to get to that door first, to move around the slow people on the road. My first impulse is to look out for number one and to protect my own. But let me tell you, the secret to life is not he who dies with the most toys wins. King Solomon had all the wealth of the world and all the wisdom. And he wrote these words. One gives freely, yet grows all the richer. Another withholds what he should give and only suffers want. Whoever brings blessing will be enriched, and the one who waters himself will be watered. Be a person of blessing. Be a person who waters and assists growth. Listen, life isn't about surrounding yourself with wealth. It's about surrounding yourself with people you love. And if you already have that, then you already have everything. Sure, and it's nice to have money. It's nice to be able to live well. But life is much better lived with people to share life with. And I, for one, love my life with all of you. Let's pray. Father God, we thank you for these words that remind us that you are generous. You are generous with me. You've been generous with me my whole life, even in the valleys. 
even in my times of need, even in my times of want, even when I have cried and looked to the sky and begged you for help, even in those moments, I was still living in the presence of a generous God. You have been so generous in my life. Lord, help me to see beyond my circle. Help me to see beyond the walls that I've built and to see your church, your kingdom around me. Your scriptures say that I should love my neighbor as myself, that I should love my enemy as myself, that I should give generously because you are a giver. In fact, you gave to the point of giving your own son who offered himself upon a cross for my sin. Just knowing that, just knowing that heaven is in my future and that I can't take any of this with me should encourage me to live all the more freely for you and your glory. Lord, I don't want to be afraid. I don't want to be afraid because I know I don't live in a culture of scarcity. I live in the kingdom of abundance and my God has all the wealth of the universe. Lord, when we leave this place, help us to remember that we are your saints and that you call us to go out into the world to show love in all its forms. I can give love through my time, through my talent, and through my treasure. Help me to build your kingdom. Advance your kingdom to live out your teachings and to love my neighbor. Amen. Hey, thanks for watching this morning. You know this is a video on YouTube and it lives out on the internet and you can always clip and copy the address up at the top, the URL, or you can click share. You can share it to your own wall to tell your friends and your family about Walden Community Church, or you can post this to the wall of someone who you think it might benefit today. I love you guys. I'll see you next week. Bye.